Fuck only fans, members, ten bands, counting bags, stay litty, no December. I'm knocking off contenders, I'm sliding on whoever. Strip it for your chicken, talking spicy, but you tender. Maneuver through the sewer, staying low like a fender. Chopper kick game, spin your block like a blender. Hey, what's good with everybody, man? I hope everybody's having a productive day. Feeling the blessing like I always say. It's one life, one chance. When you got one chance to do this right, let's get it done. With that being said, don't mind the commotion in the background. I got two little furry, fluffy dogs that are attacking one another, going crazy and acting wild because they drank my coffee. Yeah, I had a glass of coffee on the glass table. Forgot about it. They decided to stick both their noses into it and drink the rest of it, which was half a cup. So they got the zoomies, the puppy zoomies. So forgive me for the for the noise. Yeah, that's what I deal with in my household. Just utter chaos. So with that being said, man, y'all see the thumbnail. Let's get right into the video. Hit that subscribe button. Hit that like. Always leave a comment. Make sure you check the links in the description to my new songs. And yes, to answer people's questions. I will be doing a music video on that, on the on the song of the whole. Just it's gonna take a little time. So let's get into it. Couple of matters I want to address real quick before I get into the video. Everybody, uh, see the thing about it that 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 situation with Beza, that Fresno rapper. See, I seen that a, a long time ago that he was charged, maybe about a month or two ago, and then now the paperwork started surfing and so on and so forth, and he got rearrested. It's very unfortunate because I remember when I used to listen to homegrown music in Fresno. I used to dream about it in prison, like, man, one of these days I'm going to get my song on. I came out now and tried, and they don't even do it no more. But I remember listening to you know, Living It Up by Beza. And the, and the cool part about it is my brother's dropping a, a video on all his social media platforms because he signed to the same management as Beza. The manager for my brother was the same manager for Beza. And... The manager is actually dropping a podcast talking about Beza and every little thing, the telltale signs, the things that, you know, kind of creeped him out, so, you know, so on and so forth. And then my brother's doing a video because when my brother signed his contract to get signed to the management, Beza was there. And, uh, you know, my, and my, song, my brother has a song with Beza and now they're scratching it with Beza and Hollywood King, two rappers that I've, uh, I messed with. So I, I just kind of look at it like, you know, you had that popularity, you know, I mean, you, you're a Fresno native, you, I mean, you're a pretty boy, you, you, there's women all over the world. Why would you go and, why would you go and do that to your daughter? But, you know, some people brought up the circumstances, sometimes a baby mama can be vindictive and, you know, say those kind of things. But regardless, that, that, that's on his jacket. And it bothers me because I see a lot of rappers do that, and I see a lot of ind people with the in it with great careers and and promising careers. You know, they get caught up in this weird limelight, and they start they start acting out in a certain way. You know, people are not born that way, but people have been thinking that way for a long time. They just finally acted upon it and got in trouble. But still, though, man, it just it's very unfortunate because you know I wish I could be in the same circumstances and that elevated, you know, status and that that elevated success. You know, I can only hope if I ever reach those levels, man, I don't make no mistakes, man, because I'm not going to throw an opportunity away over something dumb and especially something foul like this individual did. But stay tuned. to my. If you guys want to follow my brother, he's at uh, Kid Kane on Instagram, K-A-I-I-N-E. That's how you spell it. On Instagram, that's all his social media platforms will be right there. Go check out the video, how he talks about him, because my brother knew him personally. So let's get into the video. My first Ellie that I want to talk about was in Kern Valley CR, should I say? And I had just got there. I've only I was only on I was only his celly for like maybe a week and a half, and I wound up beating up the two five, and I wound up going to the lawyer yard with the homies. So here's some East Los, cool homie, bro. But when I walked in there, he was sick. You know, he had been coming down. He, uh, you know, he was uh, he was on carga, so he, you know he was he had, he was he was sick pretty bad. He had the malias. So as I walk, as soon as I walk in, he was like, "Hey, bro, you do me a favor," and I was like, "What's up?" He was like, "Can you go to sell such and such and pick up something for me real quick?" I was like, "Yeah, yeah." So I threw all my boxes in the cell. I walked down the tier. CL's telling me to get in the house. I grab it, go back in the house, hand it to him. So as I'm meeting the individual, you know, he just breaking up that he he, he got a fat quarter, fat quarter of some, of some of some hop of some black. And I'm like, "Ooh, you know what I mean? It's party time! My first day in the cell, man. I'm finna be lit." Super often, 
finna be nodding day. So as he's talking to me, he's getting to know me. My common practice was I grab my paperwork out, hand it to him. That way I could um and then situate myself. He could read his paperwork. I read uh, uh I mean I could read his paperwork, he could read mine. But I put the paperwork down. I was like, here's my paperwork, bro. You can check that I'm, I haven't made any uh, statements on my co-defendants and my charges. And he looks at me and goes, all right, I'll check it in a little bit. Didn't distract him. That boy was needle deep in his spoon. Just, And I'm like, okay. Put all my stuff together. We get, we get lit. Now we're sitting next to each other on the bunks, and we're uh, we're not an odd, but we're we're still up and conscious and topping it up. We saved half of fifty for the morning, and um, I read his paperwork. He was convicted and got a sentence to life without the possibility for M for hire. And I was like, oh, this is an interesting one. You know, I haven't came across this one. Some people, you know, do it over uh, you know, streets and neighborhoods, but this one, he actually got paid to do this. So I asked him, I was like, bro, how much did you get paid? He was about 10 G's. I was like, I ain't, I was back then, I was like, that ain't bad, bro. I probably would have did that too. That's a lot of money, but you know, that money comes and goes. As you get older, you start to think about it. You know, money is the root of all evil. Money comes and goes. But back then when I was young, 10, 10 G's to me, I'd be like, man, that's a whip. That's this, that's this. He tells me the story. He said, look, his, uh, his mom was going through a sickness and the prescriptions... You know, they were they were expensive. And he was trying to sell he was trying to sell on the street corners for a little bit. The money wasn't that fast because he's like, everybody in my neighborhood is a is a is a dope dealer. He goes, Man, I needed a lick, bro. I needed a lick hella bad. My mom these 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 pills were expensive. The 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 condition his mom was in, it was she was deteriorating, it was eating her up, and he didn't want to see his mom sick like that. So he reached out to some people and they connected him with some um some cartel members. And they told him, they go, hey, you want to make a quick 10? He was like, yeah, yeah, I'll do it. And they told him to go to this specific address, look for the specific car, look for the specific individual, take him out. What, he, what they didn't tell him that is that dude had a brother that looked identical to him. They were only like a year and a half and apart. And they were identical. They dressed the same. They drove the same trucks. So on and so forth. They, they, you really, they, everybody said you really couldn't tell a difference. And um, so he goes at an address. He waits it out. He sees the gray Silverado truck pull up. He walks up. Dude gets out of the car. Does what he has to do in front of the in front of the gated in front of the gated. Uh, it was like a gated fence, like to the driveway though. Come to find out, it was the brother. He got the wrong one. So now the people that paid him to do it wanted not only their money back, but that he had to finish the job and take the other one out. But he already had gave them his money, his mo the money to his mom, and she invested it in all her prescriptions for upcoming this. And so he was in, he was stuck in a bind. He was stuck in a bad predicament where, and then he you know he used some for himself because you know he was a, he was an addict. He used, and he he didn't know what to do. So he was uh, he was on the run. He was going crazy. He was always hiding. He couldn't see his mom. He didn't want them to locate him at his mom's house and his mom pay for his mistakes. So on and so forth. She lasted two weeks, got busted, and he found he got found guilty. Cool part about it is that he actually was telling me like maybe maybe it was the high. Who knows? But he was like, bro, I'm actually glad I got busted, bro. He goes, my mom gets to live the rest of her life, at least taken care of for the most part. My family's taking care of her. She didn't have to suffer for my mistakes. And then he admitted straight up too, like, I'm glad I got caught, bro, because, you know, I was in a bad predicament with the wrong people. These dudes, they don't, they're ruthless, they're senseless, they're heartless. He's all, they, a lot of people could have paid for my mistakes. I didn't want my family to pay for my mistakes and they were going to hunt me down. And he's all, I didn't want to live like that. I didn't want to live on the run every day. Wonder if my homies from my neighborhood were going to take me out for these fools or these fools just creeping up on me. He said it was just a sick way to live. And I'm sitting there, I'm, I'm, I'm sitting there looking at it and I'm not an novel. I'm like, yeah, that, that kind of is true. But hey, I, I, I could have figured it out. I was like, man, why would they want their money back? It's like, bro, they gave you 10000 You knock one down. Obviously, if you knock the other dude down, you know the brother's going to want to retaliate and cause some ruckus. You know, you, you could have knocked down two birds with one stone and kept the 10 Gs, but 
You know, they, they deal with business the way they want to deal with business. But he was, uh, he was like, he sat in the cell and he kind of regretted it. He was like, man, I threw my life away for 10 Gs, bro. He goes, you don't know how fast that money went. He goes, but I needed it at the time and it seemed like a lot of money and like, my mom was sick. And, you know, I had, to, I had to understand and feel for him. I'm like, bro, I would have did anything for my mom too to make sure she's not, even though she may be dying, but she's not dying painfully. You know, I would do, I would make that sacrifice and relieve the stress, even though I wouldn't want to do it in that fashion now, today. I wouldn't want to have to place myself in a predicament dealing with cartel members and, you know, being committed for life. Because once you commit one act for them, you're going to have to commit more acts for them. They're going to look at you. They're going to utilize you. They're going to throw the money in your face. And like I said, money is the root of all evil. I'm starting to notice that nowadays. You know, money persuades people. Money clouds judgment. It clouds our mind. You know, we prioritize prices. We prioritize, we prioritize luxuries over just the simple things in life. And I would have did it back then too, for the sake of my mom. So let me know how you guys feel. Would you guys would have took that same risk if you knew it was going to help your mom relieve her suffering? Because I felt for this individual. And now he's doing live. He, he gets to see his mom every other weekend. It's difficult because she's sick. So she has to go up there. People will have to take her. But he's never, he's not going to be there when she goes. So was that sacrifice even worth it? That's my question. The second story, yeah, you hear you hear the dogs in the background going going apes, going ape crazy. They're fighting each other. So, the second story, I get to sad f e yard the level three. And my very, I was pending transfer to Kern Valley when I met this individual. So they put me over here because I went to war with the independent riders. So the first cell they put me in, man, it was dirty. The dude had long hair, so you had all of his long hairs that would fall out. They were in a sink. They were on the side of the sink because he wasn't sweeping. He had a bunch of stuff. And it was, like, packed in there. Like, he had so much stuff that he was taking up both lockers underneath the bed. He had some stuff on the top bunk. So I had to sit there and wait because he came back from the yard to drop off some food. Paisa dude, tall. He had a little straw hat. And he looked at me. And then I was just like, hey, bro, I'm your new Sally. He talked English, but he mostly talked Spanish. You know, his English was broken. <clears throat> and then he just looked at me and was like, all right. And then he walked out. And I was like, bro, you didn't even tell me if I can clean the house or move your stuff. And I was hot, bro. I was mad my first Sally. I was like, oh, I'm going to. This boy got it coming when he gets back, bro. I'm going to tell the pack your stuff and get out of my way. So I had to wait another hour. And I'm just, I was just like, man, you know what? I did my best to clean around the toilet, clean the sink. Jump in a bird bath, you know, and I just had my property right there, and I'm just sitting on the toilet because I don't want to sit on his bunk because he didn't roll his mattress up. So it was awkward. He comes back. We get to know each other. We chop it up. I give him my paperwork. Doesn't know how to read English. Doesn't know how to read. So I have to explain to him what I'm in there for, and he's like, okay, okay. But doesn't give me his paperwork. And I'm like, hold on, bro. I'm like, so I had to meet the guampas real quick. That's when I met the homie Big Worm and a couple other individuals. And I had to go talk to him in the dorm. I was like, hey, bro, my son doesn't want to give me his paperwork. Like, how do I approach this dude? So I had to get a homie that spoke Spanish to translate it to him. Like, I want to read his paperwork. I want to see what his charges are. I want to see what he's in here for. So on and so forth. It was just a common courtesy. I had to explain the whole. Because he went straight SNY. He hasn't been to the main line. You know, he just wanted to come do his time peacefully. So I read the paperwork, and I'm mind blown. I'm like, oh, wow, this is a tight one right here. This is cool. Like, I wanted to hear this story. He was in there because he didn't work for the cartel, but he did a hit for them as well. He was struggling down there in Mexico, finding work. He had three kids, and he had a family. Yeah, I mean, he had a wife, should I say. Well, he was struggling real bad. And they actually wanted, uh, he, he approached them for work. He did a few things for them just to hop out, make a couple of bucks, and they hit him with a big one. What it was is he had to take out a federale. And he was, a, he, he was a, I guess he was a marksman. I guess he was a good hunter out there. He used to hunt like wild animals to defeat his family. He was somewhere deep in Mexico. He didn't give me a lot of details, but the paperwork is two cases. One is they hit in Mexico, and then one is they hit in California that he did. That's why he was doing life in Cali. 
But Cali in the U.S. were having a debate and they were arguing about extraditing them to Mexico. But I'm going to get to that. So I chop it up with them and he tells me the story. He's like, look, man, they, they told me where this dude lived. He goes, so what I did is I stole a van. He goes, I needed the van. I needed the doors to open in the back so I could sit there. And, and he, had a, he had an old school rifle with a scope. They wanted this dude gone. But back then, you know, money up here is not money down there. We all know that. So he got paid a little less down there. But it was still enough money to take care of his family for a couple months. And he said that's what he did. He said he got out the van, sat there, and waited. He said he was sitting where the door was open. He sat there and he waited. He said he seen the dude come, get out the car. But I guess the dude realized that he was stalking in his house already because the cop was already prepared. The, feder the federale was already prepared. So the, the cop got out to walk to his house, but already knew that he was going to get out the van and snipe him. So they got into a shootout. And he blew my celly's ankle off. So when he did that, my, my celly gets down, falls to the ground, and just keeps loading. And actually takes, uh, takes, takes his life away. He, gets, he drags himself back in a van. He goes to a specific like Puebla that had his own little hospital. They bandaged his foot up kind of bad. And now his, he, can't, he can't, when he walks, he can't, he's like his, it's like his foot straight. So he walks like with a limp. It doesn't bend. It's weird. And it has like, I seen a bunch of, it's like a big old scar with a bunch of holes that where they drilled his foot back together because his ankle was all shattered. You know, it was a, it was an ugly ankle, bro. It was an ugly deer foot, man. It was, it was, it was, a, his foot looked dead, put it like that. He looked like he had a regular foot and a dead foot. That's pretty much what it looked like. Two feet, two different feet. So we, I chopped it up about him and then I read his other case that he was in here for. But I had asked him, I was like, man, what's it like, man? How did, how did it feel? What is it like to approach him? And he was like, bro, they're everywhere. You can tell the difference between the regular people and who they are. The way they conduct, they conduct business, like in the open, in the house, they let it be known who they are. He goes, it's not hard to go get fine work from them. They need workers. He goes, so one day I was just at a bar. I was drinking and I was crying and I, I needed that. My families was starving. He said, man, I had to go do what I had to do. And I approached him. They had me do a couple runs. Had me. I had, he said he had an old, old, old Chevy truck that they would put stuff in his back of his truck, fill it up. He would drop it to a different city or drop it off in these little, uh, these dirt roads, pick some up, bring it back. And he was just doing little runs back and forth during the day until they told him, if you want to make the big bucks, you can do this for us. And he took it and he did it. So he he flees. Once he started realizing that the Federalists and everybody were looking for him because of what he did to that cop. He brings his family, he uses the rest of the money that he can and pays for him, his wife, and his kids to come to the United States. They come to California. They move down to L.A. In L.A., he's working, I think, two jobs. So he was gone all day, all night, came home, went to sleep, woke up, went did it again. His wife fell in love with somebody else. Finds out about it, does what he does, does what, does what he does to her. And does what he does to him, you know, unalives them. Leaves his kid, up, leaves his kids abandoned, cause he gets busted. The cops come. He's he 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 gets caught right there crying. You know, he's crying that he did it. That he that he was regretting it. Overall, gets sentenced to life for taking out his mom, his her, uh, his wife and her lover. His kids don't keep in touch with them. And this is the part that's going to make you guys kind of like laugh, but kind of feel messed up at the same time. They didn't keep in touch with them, but he had their address. So he was always writing them every day. He had a typewriter and he would just type every day. Help me. I would help him with his English and he would send it out. And then one time we were chopping it up and he would just talk about stories about Mexico. And then this is what he do. I swear. He did this to me about 10 times, bro. 10 times in that cell. And I was only cell up with him for like two months. He would just start crying. And I don't mean like tears or like, you know how when you get sad and emotional, you get like a tear or two to run down, your eyes get watery. None of that. I'm talking about like, <gasps> and I'll be like, oh, damn. The first time he did it, I was sitting on the toilet like, oh, he's crying. He's crying. Big cries. He's, he's, he's big time crying. And he was talking about his kids. Like he, he abandoned them. He took their mom away. So I had to fill him out. I was like, okay, it's in a it's in a reasonable reason to cry, but 
I've never seen a grown man cry in that sense, in that fashion, and in that much, and that long. We 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 go through the conversation, and he does it again. Like every week, he would cry. Like one crying, he'd be writing his letter to his daughter. I would tell him what to say to make her feel special, and then he would just start crying again. I'd be like, "Oh, here we go again, bro. He's gonna cry again," and he would just cry. His situation was weird and it tripped me out. Mexico was asking the United States to extradite him back to Mexico so he could face the penalties for killing the federale. But he was begging the parole board. He was begging the committee and he was like submitting letters to the governor that he did not want to go back. And I was like, why? Fool, you, you'll get off the bus and you can have, you have like better opportunities to get out, escape, run, go see your kids, whatever. I always figured you want to be down there. And he was scared that if he got off the, as soon as he got on the Greyhound bus at the, at the, at the border, the cops are going to be waiting for him right there and they were just going to gun him down right there. And I was trying to reason with him. I was like, well, do you want to spend life in a, in a, in a here? You're going to die anyways. At least out there you have a better chance of actually escaping, freedom, seeing your family before this happens. You know, you might be able to pay him off. Who knows? And honestly, bro, I've never seen a man so scared in my life. He was scared to go back. To Mexico, he wasn't. He was afraid. As soon as he got out of the bus, either the cops were gonna take him, or the cartels were gonna take him to keep his mouth shut. So he'd rather stay in a California prison and do life. Plus, he had it made because of his foot. They gave him morphine pills, so he'd get two or three morphine pills a day, and he was selling them at ten dollars a pill. And dude, he that's why his cell has so much stuff. He has so much food, so much appliances. People were at his door every day clucking something. So he never starved. And those pills were going to be in his because he would complain that his ankle was in pain, which in reality looked like it was numb and didn't even move. But that was a story that tripped me out. And what tripped me out the most is he always cried. Sometimes I would go to sleep on the top bunk and watch TV and I could just hear him down there crying. So I'd have to throw my headphones on. I'm like, I don't want to hear him cry, bro. And I was looking for a celly like crazy. Like I needed a good celly. I wasn't about to go through this emotional roller coaster. I mean, yeah, every man has his pain. Every man has his story. Every man has his demons. But hearing a man cry to that extent, like on a consistent basis, was driving me nuts. I'm sorry to say. Sometimes you just got to, you know, you got to you gotta hold it in. You got to, you know, you got to survive, man. Sometimes it's, you got to just restrain and just bury that pain inside you, at least in this kind of circumstances. He didn't care. You just hear him down there in the bunk. <laughs> And I'm like, oh, man, I'm not going to go to sleep now for a couple hours. This is drive me nuts, bro. But those are some those those are some sellies that I had to encounter that tripped me out. They're just their storylines and they're connected with these cartel members, throw their lives away. And it, it tripped me out because when I got out, I, used to, I watched a lot of the videos and it just it's a good reminder that, you know, the things that we're doing in the in the in the in the, in the gang culture and the gang life. You know, to one to an extent, yeah, they are violent. They are we are hurting other people's lives. We are destroying other people's lives. The gang culture has caused a big crisis on the streets to where you know it's unsafe for kids. It's unsafe for parents, and it's unfortunate that some parents have to worry about their kids whether they're if they're gonna join a gang when they go to school, or whether or not they go in the streets and go out to play and ride bikes and roll uh, and rollerblade or you know just go do some recreational activities. And get hit with a straight bullet. Because you have not only the gang culture, but you have these other big factions across the border infiltrating these streets, causing some of the biggest drug epidemics, and instigating and inciting gang violence. You know, the streets have become unsafe, sad to say. And a lot of recent shootings have proven that too. That we you know we gotta protect our kids and we gotta protect one another from what's really going on out there. And it doesn't help the fact that, you know, actors and inactives want to continue this gang violence and fight one another over some prison terminologies. And we're just making we're just making the situation worse for the for the for the generations to come and the youth that we need to bring up into these communities to have a chance in life. Because I just pointed out two two situations where people that suffer from poverty and didn't have and the lack of money and the decisions they had to make to better the situation. And fend for their families and threw their lives away in the process. This could happen to anybody. And circumstances vary. 
But it just goes to show you how fast and easy it is for you to throw your life away for money, for a street sign, for a gang color, for a gang signs, for an outfit, or just being at the wrong place in the wrong time. And I think that should be a, a, a so it should be a primary focus and focus on like we need to make our communities better because these communities do have our school districts and there's a lot more bigger situations out there that we could be addressing as opposed to one another because of what we wear and what we say and where we're from. So with that being said, like I always say, man, I hope you like my video. It's one life, one chance. We only got one chance to do this right. Let's get it done. Peace.